coming up on this edition of the Center of It All. With fishing season on its way, we stopped by a local hatchery to check out the stocking process. We also took a trip to Shavers Creek to find out how to make all natural maple syrup. And Mel has got a retro meal fit for a king. These stories and a whole lot more coming up next on the Center of It All. Welcome to the center of it all. We're at Woodring's Floral Gardens in downtown State College to check out their spring flowers. And speaking of spring, trout season is right around the corner and we stop by a local hatchery to find out what they're doing to prepare the waters. It's early morning in central PA. The sun is just breaking through the clouds and already the Fish and Boat Commission hatchery workers are waist high in trout. Here at the Better Spring Hatchery we do four varieties of trout, four species, which are brooks, brown trout, rainbow trout, and then golden rainbow trout, which typically, people typically refer to as palominos. With these hatcheries, the Fish and Boat Commission is creating a fishing opportunity for the public. Basically what we are is a, a fish farm. Um, we propagate fish for the purposes of stocking into the Commonwealth waters. We do it for pre people who purchase a fishing license, and then um, with that, that gives them the privilege to go out and try to attempt to catch the fish that we, we put out there for them. There are 14 state hatcheries, and from March 1st to mid-May, the hatchery workers are up every morning loading trucks for stocking. This facility here for 2015, our request was for 572,000 adult trout to come out of here. Of those, um, about 25 or 30,000 are part of the fall stocking program, fall winter stocking program. That will take place in October and November or December of this year but the balance then, approximately 550,000 fish, will be stocked out between March 1st and about the third week of May, just, before, just prior to Memorial Day. The commission primarily stocks bodies of water that are unable to support trout all year round. We supplement those areas and those streams for, for the anglers to have an opportunity in the spring of the year primarily. With the spring of the year, the water temperature is colder, which can support trout, and the flows are usually higher which also aids in, in helping to, for the trout to be able to be in the water. The hatchery fish are raised to be caught and utilized by fishermen. What we do is considered a put and take system and the fish that we stock out into these waterways, we expect and hope that the people catch and creel the fish and take them home and, and utilize the fish. There are three local fish farms in Center County. One in Belfont, Pleasant Gap, and the Benner Spring Culture Station in College Township. The Pleasant Gap location stocks for Center County, and the Benner Spring location stocks for Mifflin and Huntington Counties, as well as other parts of the state. The opening day of trout season is April 18th. You can pick up your fishing license at a treasurer's office, a local fish and boat commission office, or at your local tackle shop, like TCO Fly Shop on College Avenue. Trout season is pretty big in Pennsylvania and Center County is a very popular destination for anglers. State College is one of the top five retirement destinations for fly fishers in, in the U.S. Uh, so on the eastern side of things, we probably have one or two uh, of the best areas uh, to fish, I guess you could say, in the eastern seaboard. Fly fishing is commonly associated with trout fishing, but according to the guys at the TCO Fly Shop, this is just not the case. When people think about fly fishing, they think traditional trout. And that's not the case. I mean, fly fishing now, I mean, if there's a fish in any body of water, you can fly fish for it. So people are now targeting carp with flies, or bluegills, uh, anything. Uh, so fly fishing is, is a tool you can use to catch any fish in any water. The main difference between traditional fishing and fly fishing is the weight and the lure being used. With fly fishing, you're fishing this relatively lightweight item. It's just usually tied with like feathers or synthetic materials, and it's really light in weight and you are relying on, on rolling the fly line back and forth. So the way of the fly line is going to deliver the fly to the target. Whereas compared to traditional fishing, you have kind of like a weighted item and the very thin line and the weighted item you put in the air and it kind of pulls the line to the air to the target. When it comes to fly fishing, it's all about the hatch. In central PA, we have great hatches, uh, meaning specific insects that come off at different times of the year. So fish can become particular to the point where they will key in on a specific insect. 
and anglers, the angler's job is to find the insect that the trout is particularly keyed in on. From the time of day to the time of the year, there is a different insect each fish will be attracted to. Locally, you know, most of our hatches tend to go off sometime, you know, in the mid to late afternoon. Um, there are some species of insects that, you know, come out later in the night. The busiest time to fish in Central PA is like right now, essentially from like beginning of April to about the second week in June. That's when we have our, our major hatches. Everything from blueing olives to the famous granum hatch, the sulfurs. So that really happens from like April, beginning of April to about mid-June. And they don't call it fisherman's paradise for nothing. Green Creek, as far as I know, has more fish per mile than the other stream in the state. Uh, it starts around State College, goes through Belfont, and ends uh, where it meets up in Milesburg with Bald Eagle. You know, here in State College, we're definitely in, in one of the prime locations for fly fishing on the East Coast. There's so many fishable waters, everything from small streams to with little brook trout. You know, there's lakes with, you know, large bass in it, and it's just, it's a, it's a great way to, you know, challenge yourself and get out and catch some fish. After you pick up that rod and reel, you might be in the doghouse. So stop by Woodrings to smooth things over. Now when we come back, we have another delicious meal from Mel. Welcome back to the center of it all. Mel has got the smell of spring right in her kitchen with chicken, crab meat, and asparagus. She's combining these ingredients for an extravagant meal. When a foodie gets to be my age, we get to take a step back and reflect on how food has changed over the decades. For me, the 1980s and the 1990s were some of my favorite in recent history. New chefs, as well as seasoned chefs, were thinking out of the box. They weren't cooking from them. So, fasten your seatbelts and strap your bicycle helmets on, kitties, because today, this grandma is going to show you just how easy cooking an elegant meal from scratch, fit for a king, can be. Let's get started. Oscar was a dish invented for King Oscar of Norway and Sweden back in the 19th century. His chef, made him a dish consisting of all of his favorite things, veal, asparagus, crab meat, and hollandaise sauce. The king loved it so much, he named it Veal Oscar. In the 1980s and 1990s, American chefs started preparing the dish, substituting chicken for the veal and bernays for the hollandaise because our American markets were being flooded with boneless, skinless chicken breasts. My favorite way to prepare Oscar is using chicken tenders. They don't call them tender for nothing. They're really juicy, moist, and tender. I've placed eight of them between two sheets of plastic wrap, and I'm gonna use the flat-sided meat mallet, not one of these jagged tooth gadgets, to pound these things to a nice, even quarter-inch thickness. Now in French, to pound means paillard. So what I am doing is paillarding chicken breasts, and the end result is I have eight paillards, which is the noun for thin pieces of meat, seafood, or poultry that are gonna cook up really fast in the skillet. And I'm going to remove my top layer of plastic And I'm gonna lightly season all these tops with some flour. I use Wondra, I like granulated flour, but feel free to just use regular all-purpose. And a really nice, nice but um, light seasoning of salt. I'm using sea salt. And same, a fresh grinding of pepper, and you can use plain black pepper. I like to use a peppercorn blend. Now I'm just going to set these aside for about five minutes to let the flour absorb any excess moisture from the tops of the chicken, and while these are resting, we're going to make blender bernays sauce. If the thought of making hollandaise sauce from scratch strikes fear in your heart, relax. My easy, foolproof blender or food processor method couldn't be easier. I'm going to start 
by putting three egg yolks in the bottom of a small food processor. I'm adding one tablespoon of lemon juice, an eighth teaspoon of salt, cayenne pepper, and nutmeg. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this noisy little machine on and let it run full power for two full minutes. This is going to take the place of the whisking that we would normally do on top of the double boiler on the stove top. It's going to incorporate air and it's going to start to thicken and warm the egg yolks. And while this machine is running for two minutes, I'm going to pop over the microwave and melt a stick of butter. That's been two minutes, and as you can see, or I'm going to show you, we've got a nice, lightly colored, lightly thickened egg yolk mixture. Now, the next thing you need to know is the only difference between making hollandaise and making bernaise sauce is, to make bernaise sauce, you're going to add some shallot, and I'm using a tablespoon of finely minced shallot, so I'm going to add that right to the mixture and the addition of tarragon. So I'm going to add a tablespoon of that to the mixture. Now when I turn this noisy little machine back on, I'm going to start adding the butter in dribs and drabs, not even a thin stream, because if we were whisking on the so stove top, we would have to constantly whisk and add the butter very slowly so that it emulsifies. And this could take up to a minute or two, so let's just start that process right now. When we come back, Mel finishes up her chicken Oscar. Welcome back. Mel is finishing up her chicken Oscar. took us about a minute and a half, almost two minutes. And what I have, I'm going to remove my little blender blade. Is a cup of some of the most divine blender bernaise sauce you are ever going to taste. I've melted four tablespoons of butter into four tablespoons of olive oil in my electric skillet. And I love to use my electric skillet for this because I can cook all eight servings or all, pie, all eight paillards at the same time. So I'm just gonna pick up my seasoned paillards and I'm going to put them in the skillet, seasoned side down. sizzling as soon as I get them all into the pan and season. Now I'm going to season the tops, the new tops of these, with another little dose of flour. And a rerun of the sea salt. And the peppercorn blend.
Now these are just going to lightly saute. We don't want them really, really golden brown. We just want them beginning to turn brown. That's gonna take about two and a half to three minutes per side. And this is another reason why I really like using the electric skillet because I can control the heat underneath all of these evenly throughout the entire process. These have cooked for about two and a half minutes per side and they're just the way I described them, really lightly browned, starting to brown, really nice and tender. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push all of my pie yards up to one side of the skillet. And when I do that, I'm going to put the traditional ingredients in here. I've got 24 asparagus spears that I steamed. They're fresh. There are people who use frozen asparagus, but we're scratch cooking today. And I'm just going to add these to the skillet. And I've got a pound of lump crab meat and I'm going to add that to the skillet. Now I'm not gonna stir these things or make any attempt to disturb the crab meat or anything like that. I'm just gonna put the lid on this and I'm gonna let the chicken rest for three minutes and the asparagus and the crab meat to warm up during the same three minutes. Oscar is a dish that is classically served just warm. It's not served steaming hot. So in three minutes, we're going to plate this and it's time to eat. This retro meal really is easy, elegant, and fit for a king. More importantly, it's made from scratch using high quality ingredients. If you were in a restaurant, you could expect to dish out $20 to $25 for each one of these servings. At home, I did the math, $5 to $6 per serving. That's a small price to pay for such an exquisite feast. For these and all of my recipes, just go to my website. Boy, are we lucky that we get to eat at Mel's every week. And that Bernays sauce with lump crab was quite a treat. Now when we come back on the center of it all, we have a sweet treat you can find in a tree. Welcome back. Now how do you usually get your maple syrup? I usually go to the grocery store. But with the right tree and some tender love and care, you can be having yourself some all-natural syrup. Since 1984, Shavers Creek Environmental Center has been hosting a Maple Harvest Festival to help people learn about the maple sugaring process. Lori McLaughlin, an instructor at Shavers Creek, says maple tree tapping is both an art and a science. The first step is identifying the right tree. And so we identify the sugar maple tree, which has a higher sugar concentration than other trees, and then we extract that sap from the tree to uh, collect it and then boil it down into syrup that we all know and love. Uh, so you tap the tree, you identify the sugar maple tree, and then you tap the tree, which involves um, drilling a hole in the tree, making a small hole, um, which doesn't hurt the tree. It's just like giving blood. Um, and so you make a small hole in the tree and then you uh, put in a spile which allows for the sap to drain out, um, gravity fed, into a collecting bucket or uh, milk jug. Usually uh, we use a lot of um, metal buckets and we collect the sap and then we take that sap to our evaporator pan in the sugar shack and we boil all that sap down into syrup. It takes about 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. So it's um, definitely an art to try and figure out what kind of syrup to make in terms of how long you boil it for, um, what uh, consistency you'd like the syrup to be, um, and a little bit of science to know when the syrup is actually done. When it comes to sugar maple trees, size does matter. Uh, we tap about 25 to 30 trees locally right around the environmental center. It's important to tap a tree that uh, you want to make sure you're being healthy and safe to the tree. And so we don't tap a tree that's any smaller than 10 inches in diameter. So we use calipers to measure the tree and make sure that it's the right size. Usually it's around between 40 and 50 years old at that point. There is sap in a tree all year long. But syrup is primarily made in the springtime when it's cold at night and warmer during the day. So once you tap the tree, it doesn't take that long for the sap to start running. And in fact, it can immediately drip out if the temperature is right. 
Um, in order for sap to run, we need cold nights, so temperatures below freezing, and then warm days, temperatures above freezing. So that movement of um, the temperature allowing the sap to leave the roots of the tree and head up to the buds, and then at nighttime, you go back down into the roots, that movement allows for a good, healthy sap run. Unfortunately, due to the bitter cold weather in early March, this year has resulted in a low sap run. It's a really weather dependent uh, activity and process and so we've had such a cold winter that really until you know the first or second week of March the temperatures weren't even above freezing. So the sap was not running and so even last week when it got warm then it wasn't dropping down below freezing at night. And so we've really had a low sap run. Um, we've collected maybe you know 15 to 20 gallons total at this point. Shavers Creek taps their maple trees strictly for demonstration purposes to show people the tree to table process. Over their two to three weeks of tree tapping, they will make up to three to four gallons of syrup. That's a pretty neat process you can do right in your backyard. Now are you looking for something new to do in the area? Well, we've got the details on a creative event that's perfect for a mother-daughter night. Mothers, daughters, and friends gather on a Friday evening for some creative fun on the second floor of Contempo Artisan Boutique in Bowlesburg. Contempo Jewelry started as an online business, but grew into a gallery, gift shop, and art studio in just three years. Contempo Jewelry is sort of how it all started. I make jewelry and I sell online and I do some shows and then I opened up the shop. The downstairs has about 40, 40 local artists that display their work that's for sale. And then the upstairs we have several um, art-related classes and we also do birthday parties and private parties. Private parties like your very own sip and paint with a couple close friends and classes ranging from youth sewing to mother-daughter jewelry nights. Jewelry classes that are by me, we have sewing classes, photography, knitting, painting, and essential oils. After an evening of creativity, you leave with some new accessories and some great memories. Simple earrings, and then we make a simple pendants. Everyone gets a chain. So then they come on and off of the chain. So in theory, they'll have several necklaces out of the one chain with all the different pendants. Contempo's events are all about getting people to slow down their busy schedules and take some time to spend some time with the ones they love. Just a great way to sort of have some bonding time. Um, I think we often forget in our daily grind just the importance of stopping and getting creative and spending time together. My mother and I would love doing something like that, and you're never too old to hang out with mom. And moms, they do love flowers. Now thanks to Woodring's Floral Gardens for letting us use their shop. And that's all for this edition of The Center of It All. For more great WHVL content, log on to our YouTube page and like us on Facebook. Thanks for joining and have a great week.